Hi, my name is Susan Elliott. I'm a nurse practitioner at St. Louis University School of Medicine. I work in the Division of Geriatric Medicine. The talk today is on polypharmacy and potentially inappropriate medications in older adults, also called PIMS. Our university does receive funding through HRSA via a GWEP grant, which is the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program grant, and part of my salary is supplemented. The objectives today are to define polypharmacy, define what a potentially inappropriate medication is, be able to list two tools for identifying PIMS, and to correlate polypharmacy and PIMS with the four M's of age-friendly healthcare. Here you see the four M's, what matters, medication, mentation, mobility. This is the overall lens that all care should happen with older adults. Um, and we'll see that as we focus on medication, it really does incorporate the other three. So let's move forward. Uh, lifespan really is something that needs to be understood um, in order to understand what prognosis is and whether or not the treatment medication that you're offering your older adult is a reasonable thing. So nursing home residents live approximately five years on average and less with dementia depending on the stage according to evidence in 2021. Over half of nursing home residents die less than six months after admission. And when we look at people with dementia in the community setting, if they have severe disability, they live approximately 1.7 years um, and less if they're homebound, greater than 90 years old, depressed, or with unintended weight loss. This is a tool that um, it's a resource that should be helpful to most people that work in uh, with older adults. It's a prognosticator. There's different um, evidence based calculators that you can use. Um, ones for the nursing home residents, whether it's a patient in a hospital or a hospice patient. There's also some very helpful um, time to benefit slide rule to look at common medications and procedures and whether these things are appropriate to offer. So I do use them and they're recommended. The American Geriatric Society in 2019 call, uh, came out with some guiding principles um, that really should be the overarching um, foundation for providing care to older adults. We need to be eliciting and incorporating preferences into the care plan. Uh, so we need to frame clinical management um, into risk versus harm. And according to the prognosis, um, and that is has a lot to do with lifespan and whether or not that particular medication is going to make a difference in their quality of life. We need to be optimizing benefits, reducing harms, and enhancing quality of life. Um, so stop and consider what matters most. Um, the biological differences in older adults are um, vast, so they have a higher body fat proportion and lower water and muscle proportions, which mean there's more drug available in the system. Many of the CNS altering agents are stored in the fat and um, older adults have a decreased clearance because of aging liver or kidneys. And if they're frail, it's compounded yet by having lower serum binding proteins. So polypharmacy uh, was reviewed in 2017 because there was no exact consensus on the definition, but the most used definition is five or more medicines is polypharmacy and then severe polypharmacy is 10 or more meds. The American Geriatric Society defines uh, what a potentially inappropriate medication is in their Beers criteria, and it's um, medications to be avoided or used in caution in older adults generally, or in those with certain medical problems. So we'll talk more about that. What is the prevalence of polypharmacy? So uh, the CDC did a large study from 2009 to 2016, and they analyzed 2 billion visits of people 65 years and older, and they found that 36.8% of visits um, showed more than five medications on the list. So polypharmacy um, was more than one, one in three people had it. And then 70% of the people had a potentially inappropriate medication. So um, I had fun making this slide. You'll see the gentleman here and his script list. And this represents really what I see in a lot of patients. So looking at the potentially inappropriate medication prevalence by setting, um, the Beers criteria was the most used tool. Um, 
38.5% detection rate, and then the stop-start criteria um, had a 60.4% detection rate. And you'll notice here that the primary care setting um, had 19%, uh, so almost one in five people um, had a potentially inappropriate medication in primary care. The nursing homes were pretty high, 29.7, so just under a third. And then hospitals getting getting close to the um, being half rate, so 44.6%. And when you look at the prevalence of what a severe drug-drug interaction is by setting, um, I was surprised to find the nursing home to be the lowest on the list. It, only 3.3%, primary care was 4.4%, and hospitals, 28.9%. So this shows the breadth of the problem. There's many tools that a person can use um, to identify what a, a potentially inappropriate medication is. Some of the biggest are listed here. There was a review done um, in 2021 that was vast, and then um, also a review in 2016. So the Beers criteria, the pros and the cons, the pros are it's the longest used, um, it's a standing list of inappropriate medications, and it's backed by an expert panel, and it's really used in nursing homes and some of the, um, the community-based homes. It provides a um, benchmark for quality, and then the cons are that it's exhaustive, and it lacks a lot. It lacks the association of adverse drug events. Um, the stop-start criteria was probably next used, um, its pros are that it's used internationally, so it has a wide application. It's correlated with adver adverse drug events, um, but it's also complicated. Uh, there is a new one, and I wanted to mention it here. Um, it's called the Medicines Associated with Geriatric Syndrome, which I liked a lot. Um, the pros are is that it has an expert consensus, and it's really associated with the problems that we see in older adults, like falling and that type of thing. The cons are that we're still building the validation evidence, but this is very promising. The Beers criteria was initiated in 2011. It just went through a, an update uh, this March in 2023. Um, they use grade criteria to support the recommendations with evidence, so um, that was very good. Uh, it applies to all adults 65 years and older across acute and ambulatory settings, excluding end-of-life and hospice. It's designed to reduce the exposure older adults have to potentially inappropriate medications. It's used as a quality metric, which I alluded to earlier. And then the information is categorized by tables, so it's pretty easy to find. Um, each table provides a rationale of why the medication could be inappropriate, and then um, the PIMS are also in other tables um, categorized according to morbidity and then potentially inappropriate drug-drug interactions. So a little more about the update in 2023. Um, the, the biggest change is that there's an anticoagulation table that's been added. Um, there's now a recommendation to avoid riv rivaroxaban and cautioned use with dabigatran due to major bleeding risks and safer alternatives. And they explicitly mention apixaban as being the safer alternative. Um, so apixaban is a twice daily medicine versus a once daily medicine, so it wears off a little quicker. Um, avoiding warfarin as a first line therapy was listed um, unless a person has a real substantial barrier because of the major bleeding risks we see with the medicine and because it actually has either similar or even lower efficacy than the alternatives. So um, when you think of all the testing that goes with warfarin and then the highs and the lows and never hitting the, the middle just right, um, that's why warfarin's been added. Primary prevention has been updated. Um, aspirin is now on the avoid list uh, for primary prevention because of its bleeding risks. And this is to align with some of the other guidelines which we'll be talking about. Decreased renal function table um, has now been updated to include baclofen. Um, they had a lot of encephalopathy that happened with baclofen, uh, especially when someone had less than a 60 um, on their creatinine clearance. So NSAIDs uh, is on the avoid list now also um, because of having a creatinine clearance less than 30. 
And then a pixaban, back to that, was actually removed from the table because newer evidence shows that it's safe at low levels. And then finally, the sulfonylurea category, uh, which used to only include the long-acting sulfonylureas, has now been expanded to all of them. And that's because of the uh, potential risk of hypoglycemia and then the other adverse effects that happen. So looking at some of the medications that actually affect our demographic um, and ones that I get asked about a lot, um, nearly every visit, are the bladder medicines. So people that have urinary incontinence and overactive bladder, um, they want the medicine. And some of them can't sleep through the night, they get up multiple times with their nocturia. But the reality is, is that the bladder medicines actually have strong anticholinergic effects. And in the red box on the left here, uh, you can see the common effects of the two most used medicines, which is the oxybutynin and the sol solifenicin. And so all of the dry mouth, the constipation, nausea, headache, all the way down to psychosis, confusion, fatigue, UTIs. UTIs is a huge problem. Um, so I've seen people come in the door with some of the other medicines as too. I've probably seen almost all of these walk in. Um, I try my best to try to stop them and let them understand that sometimes incontinence is the safer alternative. It's not always an easy fight though. Uh, looking more at anticholinergics um, that have strong effects, of course there's the first generation histo antihistamines which include your diphenhydramine, most people are familiar by the name Benadryl. Um, hydroxazine, meclizine, and promethazine. So anybody that's taking a Tylenol sleep um, or um, an Advil sleep where they don't realize it, but it has the diphenhydramine in there, um, this is a real problem. So consideration should really be given to the cumulative anticholinergic burden, which increases the risk of falling, delirium, and dementia in the young, old, and old, old. And this is from the Beers List uh, update. So this is clarified language. Um, also noted is that the anti-Parkinsonian drugs are really not recommended to um, help with the extra pyramidal effects that we see sometimes with some of the psych meds. So your benztropine and your trihexphenidyl have been added to the list. And they're not recommended because they don't really work well and they, they cause a lot of side effects. Here's a study that, actually two studies, that support the use of the medicines associated with geriatric syndromes. Um, in looking at geriatric hospital patients that were DC'd to SNFs, the average person had 14 meds, um, and 5.9 of the meds were associated with a geriatric syndrome, and an average 5.5 meds were associated with falls all by themselves. So 40% um, of all the ordered medicines on a person's list who is a geriatric patient who is DC'd to a SNF were associated with geriatric syndromes. So it, we see this often uh, because I work both in the outpatient setting and in um, post-acute long-term care is that people, you really have to scour the med list when they come into a facility to look what's on there. Um, another study was done in 2022 and found similar findings um, in home health care patients. So 98% were on a medicine associated with a geriatric syndrome and 40% of all active medications on their list um, were um, a MAD. So I prepared a few cases to go over to just highlight some of the things that can happen. Um, this is a 78-year-old white female with moderate dementia. She has hypertension, hyperlipidemia. She has urinary incontinence. Um, she has depression and anxiety. And her, her caretaker who's with us today um, said to me that she's gone down a little. She's dizzy. She's had two falls. She's not eating good. She doesn't have an appetite. And so the question is, which meds or potentially inappropriate medications um, would you get rid of? And the blood pressure was 142 over 77, her heart rate was 70, um, respiration was 18, and 97% were her oxygen saturation on room air. Um, the medication list here that you see, aspirin, 81 milligrams daily, atorvastatin, 10 milligrams daily, 
oxybutynin, five milligrams, three times a day, and that is the medicine for her bladder. The vitamin D, three, a thousand units daily, escitalopram, um, most people would recognize that by the name of Lexapro for her anxiety and depression, 10 milligrams daily, and then lisinopril, 20 milligrams daily. So I'll let you pause and think about that for a minute and we'll move to the next slide. So the answers you see here um, reflect that it, the beers list says the aspirin is really not indicated for her. This is primary prevention that she was started because of her hyperlipidemia and she hasn't had a heart attack or a stroke at this point. So she doesn't have active heart disease and um, aspirin in her demographic really uh, so this is in people older than 70 years old, is not recommended by the guidelines anymore. Um, atorvastatin, um, that can be argued because of her dementia, but I wouldn't call it an inappropriate medication at this time. And then oxybutynin is most definitely an inappropriate med. So these are my references. And that is my presentation. Um, please uh, go ahead and look at the deprescribing video because it kind of builds on this. And we're happy to share all resources that we have at the Geriatric Education Center. So if you have questions or follow-up questions, need resources, let us know. We're happy to participate. Thank you.